Schönen guten Morgen, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you here this morning. Happy to see you in uh, such great numbers. I'd like to introduce Christoph Kreuzmüller, who together with us will look at three decades of uh, permanent exhibitions at our building. You should know the following, Christoph Kreuzmüller was part of those who were uh, PhD students with Rudolf Herbst at Humboldt University Berlin. So these PhD students wrote their PhD thesis there, which is quality in itself because a PhD work on finance uh, policy in the case of Commerce Bank in the occupied Netherlands and Bohemia already show the link between occupation policy, finance policy and exploitation that happened. But that was only the start into their careers, which dealt with research question, empirical research and educational applica applications and linked the three. Christoph Kreuzmüller was responsible for curating exhibitions like um, Verraten und Verkauft, which was about Jewish enterprises in Berlin. Uh, he looked into uh, facts and figures of the time. I believe that this is one of the major challenges for somebody who's designing an exhibition. Now, if we were to go through the 130 entries in Christoph Kreuzmüller's bibliography, then we would find out that his commitment next to further cur curational activities, for example, on the topic of disaster in the Jewish Museum are very um, um, ample, but he also looks, for example, at the Kudam uprisings in 1935 and 1938, the November program, and also the arrival of Hungarian Jews in the summer of 1944. It, do, it does appear astounding that next to all of that, he's done bibliographical studies about the attendance of the Wannsee Conference. So like no second historiographer in Germany, he relates his knowledge on persecution and the photographs attached with the desire to uh, make them available for educational purposes. So not too much theory, but a lot of practical guidance to closely examine what happened. Christoph Kreuzmüller has been a long-standing collaborator of the building since 1992, a true lucky strike for us because uh, back then there were people queue, people queuing up outside of the building until the bus stop to come in. And I hope I'm allowed to tell you the following. 30 years ago, he always had the longest, most pointed shoes. So with that, I hand over to you, Christoph. So my shoes, this morning have a different form. I'm older now. I wear different types of shoes. So thank you very much, Christoph, for this kind introduction. So I allowed myself to change the title of my presentation. I give it a long thought of the title of our exhibition, What Remains? But the question is, well, what remains of a, a permanent exhibition once it's been taken down, once exhibits have been taken down? What's left of it? What does a permanent exhibition say about our building, about the House of the Land Conference? Can we see this separately, or view it separately from debates in society at all? And Shouldn't we actually wonder, and I do wonder that, whether the opening of the first permanent exhibition was something like a marginal note compared to the conference that happened three years later at the 23rd of January 1992 on um, murdering the Jewish and, and public administration, because that conference wrote history and um, has been having an impact to this very day. But well, I have to abide by the time that's, that I've got. I have 45 minutes now. So the innovative work of 80 or 90 colleagues has been so important, which all worked 
at this building, even though I can't talk about that, their guidance, uh, their seminars, the essays they wrote, the tours they gave through the building. So this is all implicit in my presentation. You will find it all in the library. I won't be comparing the curational concepts, but rather the exhibitions themselves, what they were like and what it was like to work with them. So I will take a rather individual approach and I would like to ask Peter to approach me and tell me if I'm not doing this the right way. At times it's, it's difficult. I find that uh, when I was writing my presentation, there were parts that I didn't like myself and I got sort of stuck in my own thoughts, which is something I wouldn't want to do. So Wannsee is a very iconic symbolic site. The conference was very abstract. It didn't leave any marks on the building. Adolf Eichmann didn't leave any AE initials uh, in the toilet. <laughs> Nothing like that is to be found here in the building. It left no marks at all. But still, we need to trap this conference inside the building. So 45 minutes was the time an introduction would take for a group. And I will walk you through three exhibitions in that time. I'll take it in, I'll take three steps. I will give you some key data, then I'll give you a tour of the exhibitions, and I will dedicate more time to the first than to the second and third exhibition, which uh, we will see presented at lunchtime once more today. And then I will compare some core aspects and I will include some educational concepts there. Now on the key data, you can see them here. The historical exhibition usually would um, be there for 10 years, in Banze it was 13 years. The number of visitors that you can see here, well, what does it tell us? Tell Does it tell us that uh, the exhibition was high quality? I think so. It also shows public interest and it shows us how many tourists were in time. 2006, this was the year of a football summer tale that was the year in which international tourism discovered Berlin. And after that, and this too translated into numbers of visitors that came to the House of Wannsee conference, more than half, one and a half million. And then of course we see figures influenced by the pandemic in the third exhibition. As the curators were not really mentioned explicitly enough in the first exhibition, I would like to show them here now. This was the team of the first exhibition. And this first exhibition was reviewed once in 2001 by Norbert Kampe and Wolf Dieter Kaiser. Well, Norbert Kampe was then responsible for the second exhibition. He was able to um, work with the team at the building, young historians mainly, that Wolf Kaiser and Annegret Ehmann were able to hold, to, to sort of retain in the exhibition. Peter Klein, Matthias Haas, you know them. The two of them were invited by Norbert Kampe to uh, design this exhibition together with him. It was then, as said, reviewed once in 2001. And the third exhibition was designed by Elke Griglewski, Hans Christian Jasch and David Zoldan, even though it's interesting to know that Elke and Hans Christian used to be freelancers at the at the exhibition before. So on the exhibitions themselves, let me say the following. Well, historical exhibitions are usually set up in a chronological fashion, and we can see this being the case here as well. So um, this is German date setting, 1933, for example, is the, the um, evident year to work with in German terms. So 1933 to 1945, the second exhibition looked into a longer space of time and looked into anti-Semitism also starting from 1880. And the third exhibition, refers to the here and now, to contemporary 
times one could have thought that uh, the third exhibition would have related to or circled around subject matters, just like in the second exhibition, but also a more radical approach would have been possible. For example, we have 15 rooms in the building, but we also had 15 attendants plus the, uh, the secretary, that uh, the young lady that hasn't really been researched enough. So um, we could put Mr. Heydrich in the toilet if we wanted and uh, give the other 15 the other rooms. Or we could say, uh, well, 15 rooms and uh, we have 20 uh, pages of the minutes or, well, we could have placed the pages of the minutes in each room. That could have been a concept as well. Next question, are there any objects, any artifacts? So in the first, exhibition, there were exhibits, objects. I can remember um, long um, uh, straps of cloth with uh, yellow stars on them that was removed. And in the second exhibition, there were no exhibits, no objects. And the third exhibition has some flat objects apart from the video cassettes as facsimiles of documents and a couple of books. So actually the exhibitions are um, um, actually free of any objects, even though objects could have been collected. For example, uh, the pen uh, Miss Wellemann used, and I know that the car Mr. Heydrich um, was killed in um, is still there. I mean, it, it could have been exhibited, but it's not been done so far. When talking about objects, you have to talk about uh, the pen, and uh, they were often seen as a symbol or a historical object. And Tillmann, Mutter Kuckelberg, and his colleague um, wrote a very nice contribution. And for that reason, I will not um, elaborate on it. Um, well, I've been working on that table for many years, and it is some kind of phantom pain. It is uh, staged in a way, and it was like a theater play. And I was used to uh, using the table to lean against it, and I sometimes feel naked if I have to stand in that exhibition with no table. Well, rooms. Well, the first exhibition used all those 14 rooms. And the second exhibition even um, expanded it by the Winter Garden. And then another aspect was never implemented. Um, it was at the caretaker's uh, house. So, um, all those uh, villas in uh, the vicinity and uh, with the house and the focus should be um, exhibited. But none of the exhibition ever really did that, this guest house. Nobody really looked at it. And well, now concerning the second part of my presentation and the tour, well, to remind you, the first exhibition from 1992 to 2005, where we're talking about a blossoming landscape of memories. Um, 1986 to 1992 was rather dull, and then um, the blossoming only followed. The first exhibition at uh, one um, principle, which is quite exciting, really. I'm using the cursor, I hope you can see it, room number six, that was the conference room, and that continues to exist until today. Since this definition um, is fixed um, as a curator, um, well, you have little time until you reach the conference room. If you walk the other way around, you have you would have a lot more time. So you have to make a decision on the direction, but the room had been defined like that. So physically, you have to work swiftly in order to um, come from 1933 uh, to 1945. Well, and this um, 
um, curator Werner like staged um, the exhibition and uh, there were glass walls, big photographs and uh, little text really. So uh, it was association based and uh, there was no information about the team of photographers or the sources of the text. So that was the first uh, tour in Germany, I'm guiding you through this room because these objects were to be seen in all three exhibitions. Objects have their history too, if they worked, if they were functioning. So here you can see the march, uh, march uh, to the north, um, the uh, pillory march and Heinz, um, and Eichmann is visible here. And that has been in use all the time the war in Poland, the ghettos. And if you see the photo on the right, the everyday life in a ghetto, the person at the table is somebody who um, it used to be a color photograph, but it's black and white now, and here mass shootings. And the title was um, programmatic, really. There were mass shootings, and I even covered a few photos because it was really, really brutal. And always um, these um, time um, tables, and you can see them in every room. And if you move out of that room, you are unexpectedly in the room of the conference. So um, the killing was already happening, but why the Wannsee conference? That was very difficult to depict, in fact. And here you um, can see the room after the first revision where a number of documents documents had been added. And this is a very beautiful room indeed. Um, oh, the Hall of um, Deportations. And it is really important because what is the result of the Wannsee Conference? Well, it is the fact that the deportations were starting Eurowide. For that reason, this room was really important. And um, that was a problem also when um, passing on those photographies. I don't even know uh, this is why I have a question mark here, but uh, then um, the death camps, uh, the Hall of Nations, and then through to the room of Auschwitz, and, and uh, it's a symbolically charged place, but uh, there is another place, Auschwitz Birkenau. Uh, this really stands for the genocide in Europe. And, and then you came to a room where with every tour, I asked oh, what title is it? Life in a concentration camp. That of course is a mutual contradiction. It is contradictory in itself. And as you can see on the right, um, these um experiments on um, human beings that's very very difficult and uh, the question is whether it is tangible or not a question that i kept asking a lot and that was uh, subject to heated debates here the ghetto uprising not one of them but we showed the warsaw ghetto uprising as a symbol for um jewish resistance and we showed it on the example of the photos here and not like um, any other stop, but it was Warsaw precisely. And then one room is called the end. I never commented on that because I felt there was nothing to comment on. And then the liberation, are a difficult title. Well, anyway, you can see this narrow room, which then ended in an epilogue. Uh, there were stones with uh, swastikas, um, graves. And then Aktion Sühnezeichen campaigns in Auschwitz. And they showed people who worked there. They have a big role to play at the beginning when reaching the memorial site. This is a guest book in 1996. One family says, a very interesting and well prepared exhibit. Is it possible to have English translations of the display? Well, in 1996, we did not yet have. English translation. It was a German only exhibition. 
I think it was no earlier than 1998 that translation was available. Gerd Schönbarner's um, attitude, this is what Schönbarner writes in an essay where he reports about um, the making of this permanent exhibition. And Schönbarner is shown from his eloquent side yeah, the realistic detail as a dramaturgic um, well um, staging can be useful. Now the second exhibition from Norbert Kampe and his team and he took a different decision, you go through the big hall and then you turn left. It means visitors have a lot of time until they reach the conference hall. And there were three rooms. And this is the eighth room. Here, the participants were introduced with photos also from their private lives and then the protocol. And well, there were boxes where you were able to, audio boxes where you could listen to Eichmann's explanations. And the conference itself was given the biggest room. And then also when it came to deportations, a lot was quoted there. Three European countries were shown there. And uh, thus, the conference was somewhat captured in that exhibition. Well, let's move through the exhibition. This is uh, the big room and it is open now and um, also the view on the Wannsee. And you were often faced with the um, map in 1933 and then you went to the room that racism anti-Semitism and then the rise of the NSDAP, that was the thrust of his research really. And then the persecution of the Jews and then resistance and self-assertion of Jews. And this is what it was called, uh, genocide in Poland and Western Europe. So it was strictly in a chronological order, but then Southwest Europe, um, there's a spelling mistake, um, but anyways, um, this journey was really interesting, and the path, the path to genocide. Well, in scientific terms, it was at the room that really triggered a lot. That around the 12th of December, there was um, a very decisive period, you know, as Dan Dina called it, the threshold of time. Just a moment. Then you went across different rooms until you reached at the conference rooms. And I will make a comparison of rooms in a minute. Well, all the way through to the, um, from deportations to concentration, death camps, forced labor and death in concentration camps. And I brought you only one photo in order to save a little bit of time. And this shows the difficulty of the exhibition. It was very, very crammed at times. You sometimes had to say, here you can see. And then the group said, what do we say, see? And then you stood on a, chair and said, oh, well, look here. Yeah. But the integration of documents was excellent, you have to say. Here you can see the photos from the Lili Jakob album. And, you know, the knowledge of that time was explained very well. And where did the photos come from? Well, from a photo album. This was explained clearly. And then you went to room where it was called the presence of the past made by Leschi and uh, there were quotes, you know, more like a brainstorming, like some um, final thoughts and Jeter Wolf, Luther Kreisig, 
uh, one of the founding fathers of Aktion Sühnezeichen and also uh, members from the Alumbrenner family. They were one of the four families whose fate was integrated in the exhibition, which was very modern in 1996, but it was still somewhat submerged, you know. But at specific points, they were woven into the exhibition. But I know from the guided tour that it was still very difficult to follow. And then there is one room I can't talk about because it's the room that. Uh, is not realized. And by the way, it is um, in the building where my office is. And it, a memorial site of national and international importance uh, really needs to be um, well, um, really at, needs to keep abreast of current research results. Now, the third exhibition, I will not elaborate too much on it because I still want to make a comparison between them. And um, once again, it's a short path uh, turning right, and it is staged in a way, but there is still a rupture. So um, the house is really opened, but at the same time, it is closed in a certain aspect um, in the corridor. You can see the tiles, but at the same time, a um, corridor is closed. So it is on the one hand, um, an opening, but it's a closure at the same time. And there's the former kitchen and also pantry, and they are very dark, and there is a staging. You can see technology orange. These are the audio boxes where those affected, the victims, are talking to us. So uh, there's a strong spatial expression. I'm skipping several rooms. And it is the second last room of the exhibition now, it's the room where the um, museum is becoming a museum itself. It is the history of the memorial site again. And here you can see an interview with Gerhard Schönberner. And, and that's really exciting. So the last, the latest exhibition is the first one to ask what kind of institution are we at all? And the walls as well, the walls from the library that go beyond the conference. But unfortunately, it doesn't talk about the research results of uh, the institution because they had their own research department at times. This is a quote that I've been looking for for a long time. And if I do it, once I have to do it uh, twice and three times. This is a characteristic of the curators. The uh, commemoration of uh, the murder of uh, Jews has characterized our societies in different ways until today. That's what I haven't mentioned expressly so far, but I think the strength of the exhibition is that it opens up and the texts are written in a way that they are comprehensible for almost everyone. And thus it opens up towards our society or societies. Well, the comparisons, the first thing you have to compare is the room. And by the way, we can't be certain whether it is the room. Technologically speaking, we can't exclude that the upper room where the board of directors is, whether that was the conference room, because it gives the best overview of the room and it has an elevator. So um, I don't know whether this is definite. I think it is interesting and exciting to think it that way. Okay, we have defined this at the meeting room and the first exhibition really showed a lot about what it can look like. The protocol as a central exhibition object is mirrored and correlated with the biographies of the participants. 
although it's exciting to say that uh, we didn't have photos of every participant. Um, there was one participant who we didn't have uh, photos about, and sometimes we only had black and white photocopies of a photocopy, so it looked kind of a washed out black and white contrast. So um, there was a juxtaposition of the protocol and the photos, the guides and the visitors then had to make their own connections. And then this really looks like a um, ladder in a hen house and um, they are next to each other. And I think the photo was uh, taken in 2000 or so, photo of the room. And the next exhibition was uh, like that, an organizational chart, and uh, then uh, the table, the objects, and the gaze to the, the view to the sea is open, interrupted only at times. And this exhibition is uh, very different. And this photo explains my phantom pain um, that the table is not there. And um, here you can see the protocol and the participants are looking to the uh, windows. When looking at the participants, uh, there is an intelligent clustering um, police at the left, ministries in the center, and the administration and the party on the right. And well, the cluster may be smart, but on the other hand, you know, people had been promoted. And then what's the difference between SS and the party? What's the difference between Schutzstaffel and uh, the party? So should you take them apart or not? So you can integrate them again during guided tours. The difficulty to um, discern them at all. And then the first mentioning of uh, Weizsäcker, the um, state secretary, he had not been mentioned in the previous exhibitions. It had been planned, but it wasn't uh, realized until then. This room is Auschwitz, and then um, uh, um, death verdict, it says here. And um, on the left, I think this photo is from Bernhard Walter, 26th of May, 1944. And this is portrait format, the album. And this is why Schönbrenner picked it. And he picked it for the original cover for his uh, book, The Yellow Star. And well, the exhibition already had it this photo on the wall, but uh, it was cut in a way to give it the Triptychon character. And thus, uh, there is um, a, a woman and um, also a man in front of the trains. And again, no quotation of sources. In the second exhibition, it was clearly different. So photos were used in a better way and not too big. Sometimes it was difficult, you know, with guided tours. If you have uh, 30 children in front of you and uh, if 20 say we can't see anything, it was difficult at times. But this, um, you know, comparison um, or putting into perspective was not always successful. Here um, is a photo of the Nuremberg laws. And then uh, here it says uh, the denunciation of uh, somebody who worked against the racial laws in the archive of the North. But, um, you know, the series was um, sold as postcards. This would be a photo analysis, uh, which I called for. And these photos, um, this is uh, from 1935, and all visitors said, yeah, that's the result of the Nuremberg laws. And um, the anti-Semitism and the um, pushing from the grassroots level, this is uh, what people, what the guides had to um, explain. And 
in the new exhibition, sometimes well, the photos have been picked in a far more in a smarter way. They are visible. Um, they have sufficient light and lighting. And here, it seems to be the first boycott on the 1st uh, of April 1933, uh, plain vanilla. There is a gender bias, of course. Um, a woman sees like, oh, I'm not supposed to shop here. And um, the SS person is friendly. We know from the files that um, the owner um, of the shop was forced to close his uh, store. And, you know, there was a blockade and it was violent. And I think the violence is not sufficiently shown and you have to um, work on it. And there is a photo station. Um, this, uh, of course, is advertising, but um, I was allowed to develop that photo station. It gives you hints on how you can deal with photos. So, of course, I don't want to um, tell everyone that I know how to handle photos. On the representation of violence, and well, I think um, this already was very violent. I took this photo with my analog um, camera. I tried to blur the photo, but even that is not sufficient. So for that reason, I have covered certain aspects, but you can also see the staging. On the left, you can see the men uh, photographing and um, photographing the naked women and um, it's a paparazzi-like approach. And, you know, these photos have all been cut. And so violence is done to these women and um, they are humiliated even further. And this is very hard to take for us. There are more scenes of violence, um, humil humiliation of Jews, shootings, and uh, this was shown in smaller photos. And um, Krista Shikara's room, I believed, showing this suffering of the dying prisoners in drawings. I thought this was this room was really, really very well done. The present exhibition is cautious, also takes a cautious approach. There was a lot of a discussion, a debate about the photos that um, were suitable to be displayed. And this is the most um, violent one. And you don't see the murdered person's uh, faces. I think this is a correct decision to take. Let's come to my last point. What to do about bureaucratic admin procedures? And um, now, 40 years, on the 40th anniversary of our exhibition, I would love to speak about that again, because I think we need to come back to that. There are photos, this is one from the exhibition, this is a bureaucratic procedure. Um, this is putting stamps on some documents. This is a bit too um, boring, I think. And Ruth Preuss's presentation shows um, the invitation letter, for example, and the handwriting on it. And um, I think that's interesting. Page six, I think, is part of this. We need to really read the documents, compare the documents, skip through them and do that together with the visitors. I don't know how exactly we can do that. And it's such an, an interesting question. How can we show the bureaucracy in a place that was so much shaped by bureaucracy? Thank you very much for your kind attention, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Christoph Kreuzmüller. This was a very well executed solution to the task, showing the three exhibitions throughout the 30 years. I'm very impressed by the many details you've shown. And what I really liked was the three statements which um, 
juxtaposing them like that could um, make us um, go into um, a sort of um, flow of thoughts, but we need to be cautious now against uh, going too much into the details of what happens to the exhibits of an exhibition once they've been taken down. So let's think about whether the changes that have occurred since the first exhibition, whether these changes have um, been reflecting the blind spots or the weak spots of societies in Western East Germany. Let's think back of 1992. Gerhard Schönbrenner back then curated an exhibition which worked with, um, a, say, drama-based staging approach with large-scale photos, with uh, very scarce captions and comments, rather expressionist way of um, shaping the exhibition. And it sort of forced the visitors into dealing with that. 1992 was the year in which Holocaust research internationally and especially in the Federal Republic of Germany started to explode. We've um, heard talks about the start of the new perpetrator research. There are some famous books that were published then and the recently opened memorial site, which starts to be a bit more international, even if what happened there was only a 90 minute meeting even though that was of a European shape. And the memorial site had this responsibility to show current research findings. So my first provocative question to you is, wasn't that allegoric from the start? And how about the second exhibition? Let's look at the year 2005. This was a moment in which other big exhibitions and other debates made sure that there was a high potential of conflict back then. I just think of Mr. Goldhagen and the Wehrmacht exhibition, which uh, had been closed in 1998 and was reopened in 2002, and um, which had a very important impact as well. And um, now the current exhibition deals with other projects it turns towards the people that's what it wants to be it turns to people who have special requests to be informed and this is what we do today so um, the three exhibitions could we say that they reflect the state of the german society and also its weak moments and spots. Yes, of course, I didn't go into that because it would make uh, the presentation very long, but yes, in 1992, that exhibition had sort of um, fallen short of meeting the needs of its time. And uh, it wasn't just praise I was given when I said this, but this was anachronistic. And of course, perpetrator research and uh, the Himmler diaries were found. There were new documents that uh, we found because of the archives that were open and we had to um, sort of work with these documents to start with. So the second exhibition did reflect the sign of the times, but then the Süddeutsche Zeitung wrote that it did echo the debate on the Wehrmacht exhibition. And I thought this was a clever way of commenting things. Having said that, I'm sorry for saying this, but any historical exhibition that you work for years on once you open it is outdated because the medium itself is responsible for that because you take up thoughts and concepts that you write down and then you go on research and until the exhibition goes online two years have passed or two and a half years so the thoughts you first wrote down few years back 
um, are also part of the past at the very moment of opening the exhibition. And that's a bit of an issue that any historical exhibition is. It's due to the, the medium itself, because an online exhibition, a virtual exhibition, is um, has a quicker processing time. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have this type of exhibition. It wouldn't mean that what we thought three years back was not worthy, but we will just have to, to live with this fact. That's true. We need to live with it. I would like to come to another point with regard to the second exhibition, just curated by Norbert Kampe. And which you said uh, was qualified to be um, reflecting the then state of the art of research. And it stands for the need of the um, of uh, the, the me me memorial site to feel safe in asserting its positions. And when I remember that, it wasn't just a question of being scientifically on the safe side, but especially the fact that the, the, the exhibition team, the team of permanent staff and freelancers collaborated here. And in the end, that led to the um, number of exhibits and uh, the documents exhibited was supposed to prepare the ground for people to guide themselves through the exhibition. And as you carried out um, some research once about the concept of um, mutuality, maybe the concept in the second exhibition was just a service you did to the educational department, something that uh, Mr. Schoen Schoenberner wouldn't even have been interested in doing. I know that the concept of mutual guidance, which we had uh, developed in Mr. Schoenbrenner's exhibition, did not work so well in the second exhibition because the school students and other students who came to visit did not find their way around for all the material that was on display. It was hard to tell them you um, only pick out two or three things because they were wondering what two or three exhibits will we pick? If it's 60 to 70 exhibits, then it was overwhelming for the pupils who came to, to visit the site. The second exhibition worked really well for um, study days or days of study spent at the educational site. So for individual professions, you would find an, an object or a reference document to turn to. That was great. And so this, this fear expressed by the very exhibition of forgetting about something relevant spoke of of the fear of um, the of the museum to to forget better to forget any important details so it was harder for people to make their own way through the exhibition also because the photos were so big that uh, Pupils would think in the first exhibition, well, we'll take, should we pick this one or that one? Then, then they'd be able to talk about it. But in the second edition, the fear of just overlooking something was always part of it. Okay, not having considered things, this was important. So with regard to all the three exhibitions, there's something I wanted to... Uh, come back to also turning to your expertise as a photographer in history of historical matters. Aren't we confronted with a problem in the history of persecution in Germany or Austria that the photos we have at hand always come from 
cities, from towns. This is something that um, struck me the other day because it was a photo of which you say it's dated July 1935 and it wants to represent the violence forced, forced upon people from above and um, buffered through the Nuremberg laws. So this photo is supposed to be a representation of this situation that led to the codification of the Nuremberg laws. So then we tie that or relate that to photos from Berlin and Vienna, but both countries were really countries marked by rural life. Aren't we running in the risk of suggesting a reality that wasn't actually there because the real term attacks that happened in small villages where people all knew one another, because we would have rather have to imagine that than the societal reality transported by the photos we have. True, that's correct. The large cities are overrepresented in the photographic material we have. Having said that, if we look at the cities that we have photographs from, namely the Jewish program, then almost any small town with a synagogue in it that suffered attacks and humiliation, well, we always, almost always have photos made of that. For Berlin, we only have 24 photos, which only ever show the place after the violence has occurred. And then they show um, what's left, the rubbles, the shards. And the House of the Wannsee Conference is part of the Glass Sea um, project, which uh, collects photos of deportation. And deportation was photographed in rural areas more than in the large cities. We still have no photo of Berlin deportations taking place, even though we made a call one and a half years ago and many people were interested, but nobody sent us a photo. Well, I think today, we don't have a physical audience trying to take the floor. Oh, well, yes, we do. But maybe I can ask the director that, first of all, we look after the question from the chat. I was just... Uh, well, there's a question from the chat from Dr. Bartold. Um, and it is very hard to hear the um, moderator. So we are waiting for the question to be repeated. Mr. Bartos asked why in the third ex uh, exhibition, at the time period from 1880 to 1933 was not reflected. Okay, once more, why is the time period of um, before 1880 not represented in the exhibition? And the second exhibition uh, question is from Ms. Rochmann. She wants to know, are their insights from the guest books, whether the different exhibitions have been received differently from the public. So did visitors appreciate the changes or do visitors accept the exhibition as it is. So has it been described as violent in the first exhibition? And were people relieved that the aspect of violence was taken out in the second and third exhibitions? Well, let me start off with the easier question. Why was the time before 
the radicalization of anti-Semitism around 1933, why was it represented less? Well, on the one hand, it was a decision from the curator to turn to the right. Then you have little physical space. It's simply a fact. And then a weighing of the pros and cons. What is more important for us at the time after 1945, going to the present or the time before? It is okay to ask the question, but it is okay to take a decision like that. It is especially the time afterwards, um, which keeps us awake. And it's a decision that I find plausible and it has been communicated like that. Concerning your other question, we have no full analysis of the guest books so far. Aya Zafati, my colleague, has made an exhibition of the comments of uh, visitors from Israel and If I try to remember that in the spirit of the 90s, the reflection of the humiliation and violence did not strike visitors' attentions. Uh, Peter may be able to add on that, but uh, there was a lot of talk about shame, about these atrocities so the awareness that the photos um, were a humiliation at the beginning i simply accepted that you know that the way you exhibit it and at some time at some point i said oh, well there are school children that are giggling yeah that's true so all the freelancers and uh, permanent um, staff members, you know, first um, needed to be sensitized themselves. And at the reactions of the younger visitors, you know, in front of such photographies were very self-evident. So you were easily faced, or quickly faced with the situation that this humiliated naked woman on a big photo and um, making a guided tour of the exhibition like that. And uh, it was even more difficult for the first generation of female freelancers. Um, this is a scandal. It is uh, sexualized violence and um, making it a topic. So in the entire um, museum, we reached the assessment that the um, exhibition of such photos pointing to sexual violence, that it is not acceptable. And Mr. Schoenbeiner cannot protest anymore. But at that time, he felt attacked, you know, um, concerning the staging of his uh, exhibition, he said, this woman um, appears like a Mary, but then people were really uh, of, angry, of course, and there is a sensitization process, and um, you clearly saw that in the change of direction in uh, the second exhibition and that more people were involved in the second production process. Yeah, there was a learning for everybody here. In a way, I am embarrassed that I didn't uh, notice it in the beginning, but that's something we all learned together or that we had to learn. Well, it's got to do with the fact that with the um, overall concept of uh, that generation in the early 90s, the Holocaust, 
um, is uh, very violent. And if you were able to show it, you did, like the yellow star. Schoenberger made this book in the 60s because he wanted to visualize the scandal, the silent society um, should really be uh, confronted with its atrocities uh, with this uh, photo book. And um, this lasted until the 90s. And uh, there were, you know, aspects of the first exhibition that you really had to act against. Yes, or mass shootings. I left out that room because it was so difficult. Yes, and concerning guest books, it's true that um, in the 90s um, that certain books were torn out of, uh, pages were torn out of those pages, or you put um, a new, uh, or you open a new book if there were anti Semitic, uh, you know, uh, remarks in guest books, uh, then you didn't want to see them every day. And at some point, uh, we said uh, this has to be removed. And of course, nowadays, it would have been a document of contemporary history. Then one could see which waves of anti Semitic outbursts. Uh, it, you know, was also made in the guest books. So we will not be able to reconstruct that. Well, we have a very dedicated um, public and from Ms. Lesky come a comment. There was a um, an, an impressive comment as long as the photo um, is in the exhibition, she would be violated every day over and over again. Directly after the opening of the first exhibition, I visited the, the exhibition with my son and, um, and then I asked him, do you want to see your mother exhibited like that? And Good morning also from my side. Thank you very much for this presentation and the interesting insights. And uh, I was too small, I think, at the time of the first exhibition, and I only noticed it in passing. My impression is that all three exhibitions um, are revolving around two aspects. The one aspect being the question concerning the voices of the persecuted. So what do we focus on? Is it the aspect of uh, perpetrators? Is it a venue of perpetrators? And what role does the experience of the persecu um, persecuted or the victims have? And I think in the first exhibition, and the way you presented it, uh, that there was a lot of room for that. And the question is whether it only looked like that or whether it was actually true. And maybe this is not the case in the third exhibition. How do you actually represent the voices of the victims? And the second actually was the perpetrators. And my impression was that in the first two exhibitions, there was a strong focus on the 15 participants of the Wannsee conference. And the aspect of uh, perpetrators was kind of um, closed. And in the new exhibition, I think they're also trying to show the participation of society, to put it in the center, because otherwise uh, everything else would not have been possible. And as you called it, Peter Klein, uh, the feelings of the Federal Republic. And in other words, um, have we uh, come to terms or what is the status quo of uh, confronting and the German past, and then is it from a historical perspective, or like in the third exhibition, rather 
a more educational perspective and uh, questions asked from the educational point of view. I think this was a whole series of questions, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, I'm really thinking. So, uh, yes, um, the participants. I think the second exhibition was the one that showed clearest where the men came from. Here it was only the men that were shown. Where did the participants come from? Where did they come into play? But Peter, I think we can discuss about that. This is you know, what I have in the small rooms, you know, in the current exhibition, there were cards like that you could pick and see when did he come into play. In the second exhibition, it was like, here are the rooms and here it is really the rooms that are shown um, consecutively from a curator's point of view, it is good, but it may be submerged, you know, a an exhibition must have a strong gesture, otherwise it will not be visible. It is only half the answer. It would be, uh, Schoenberger would have said the Nazis. It was the Nazis. And the second exhibition says, and I'm really summarizing the administration. And from what point of view it should be done, well, Schönberger has done it from an aesthetic point of view. Schönberger was anything. He was a great filmmaker and he integrated all that and also has political anger. So deep down, she's angry. And the second exhibition is uh, more scientific in its character. And the current exhibition is an exhibition that asks questions and that opens up. So we only have one ex um, historical exhibition and that was the second one. Maybe Peter would like to add on that. Well, I think a reflection on this question is well worthwhile. The details are different, I believe, but uh, that's due to the fact that if we remember certain corners of the exhibition that we may perceive differently. But I would like to emphasize that we had one room that was called scopes for action. And that was quite distant from the participants of the Fanzi conference. What real possibilities, what realistic possibilities um, did a potential perpetrator have in order to deal with uh, orders? I could give you many details, but in fact, we opened up or we created a situation where three rather, you know, subordinate members of the Wehrmacht as local commanders, how they reacted on the orders um, of for immediate shooting of Jews, one immediately executed it, and um, then uh, somebody else decided on sabotage, uh, doing nothing, and they also reacted with discussions. So we thus um, emphasized that um, you also find numerous examples of people mostly unnamed who in their everyday lives were 
constantly confronted with this order situation and that actually choose different ways of reacting and that is linked to the fact that um, with the question that perpetrators from ideological motivations or due to the pressure from the group of peer pressure um, that's something that harbored a big conflict potential and you must never forget um, that this was uh, the demand situation, to put it very bluntly. And nowadays, of course, it is different because when asking questions relating to the perpetrators and uh, the foundations are no longer linked to questioning the democratic basis here. That means in the past decades, a lot has happened. And here you can argue using examples, but before that, one had to provide proofs. And the first exhibition really is the appeal, like come here and take a look at that, face it. And there are cultural backgrounds that we must never forget when I'm talking about this museum, because in the educational work and uh, also in the emphasis made by the library and of course, um, everywhere else, like in the exhibition spaces. Okay, so we have four more questions. One is from Dr. Heberhardt. Now, looking back on 30 years, what do you think we will look back on this exhibition on in 10 years' time? Next question, a bit longer, from Mr. Köhler. Thank you for this presentation. My question, participation and transfer are two fashionable terms in educational work. We can make them a starting point of concepts for exhibitions. What do you think we can do beyond the concept? How can we integrate them into exhibition concepts? Should I repeat? Okay, so in what way can we bring in new ideas to the concept of exhibitions? And this refers to educational work. And before that, it was participation and transfer, was it? Okay. All right, thanks for this question. Dear Mr. Eberhard, I could say in 10 years time, we can say that uh, given an exhibition will take around 13 years in a museum, then in 10 years time, Peter and I will probably be sitting here again and saying, well, no, the first exhibition was totally different. In 20 years time, I don't know. I would hope, and here I'm referring to the second question, and thanks for the praise. So in that time, we might see exhibitions being more participatory. Modern technology can be used to display photographs and other documents, like documents once printed on paper, so the technology will help us de-analyze these exhibits at a deeper level. And this in-depth analysis will be fully understood by visitors. What Ruth Preusser did in our exhibition is just great. She is showing why is an exhibit um, appearing the way it is? What does it look like? Why is this so 
questions like why was a photo taken why was another photo not taken and this might mean that we will exhibit far less objects because the exhibit that because the exhibits we have the objects we have we need proper photographies to to be able to exhibit them then and this in-depth access well we would try to relate these elements to one another this photo showing the march of shame north we need to relate that to the statement of one of the women after the war on her recompensation file and also the first use made of the photos when were they actually used why were the women displayed never asked for their permission and that would lead us to another level and i think we will see that happening at this museum in 12 and a half years time not a 20th time so that presupposes us as a society working on the further development of this place putting resources into that because what i'm suggesting now has to do with a lot of research work and goes hand in hand with that because having proper object biographies means having the pre means this is a prerequisite for an in-depth analysis we'll show less exhibits and relate them to one another link them up I would like to comment on the second question. I'm not really sure whether I can contribute anything meaningful, but if we wonder what the exhibition will look like in 30 years time, then I can say, well, I won't be here in 30 years time. And I believe that the unique selling proposition, if you so will, of the exhibition will still be the Wannsee conference, the meeting itself, and probably technological progress will make sure that we can free ourselves uh, from a physical presence at the building. There's going to be a lot of virtual reality, there's going to be a lot of augmented reality, and these options will help us circle around the building's USP, which is the building itself. And we will further have to work on the long-term message of the exhibition, making that clear. I think there's going to be waves of um, emphasizing one element more strongly than the other. For example, bureaucracy, sharing a workload in society, sharing the workload of bureaucracy, separating responsibilities, but does that lead us to, then we might speak about the routines of administration processes and relate that to um, crude anti-Semitism, the impact of which day to the very day, when this is something that everyone can retrieve in modern mass media. And within minutes, you can get to any gathering of anti-Semites uh, anti if you want to. So it's waves of um, contemporary moods that will be used by the educational site, and we will react to each and every one of these waves of interest and there's going to be mission statements and in the long run we will present ourselves as the german institution that has made it a task for themselves to follow up on these developments which does not mean of course that other memorial sites are not doing the same but the topic of the meeting itself can be turned into a transnational or pan-European topic of reference. And in 30 years time, 
on my 90th mm -hmm. anniversary, that's going to be the case, I believe. And um, I don't know whether we will have a second, third, fourth or fifth virtual level go into the question of the who was who in more detail, of course. But if we take a look at the bigger picture against the backdrop of what happened in the last 30 years, I think that's going to be happening in 30 years time. So is there time for taking more questions from the floor now? Yes, we can take one more question. Here's a question from Ms. Gellis, Ursula Gellis. Is there any evidence about friendship which might have emerged between former collaborators to the memorial site and survivors. Well, Monica Sommerer started this wonderful campaign, 80 of, of publishing 80 testimonials, contemporary ten, ten te testimonials in 80 blog entries. And I did write to someone, some an acquaintance of mine, maybe a friend, and I was able to ask him to release some some secrets uh, he could share, maybe some special memories he has, uh, haven't been a time witness. I know that I've been in touch with some survivors. I know this from some colleagues, but well, um, these time witnesses are leaving us now. Ursula, that's a thing of the past. Well, I couldn't add anything to that. Um, same here, I could say, from my work at Wannsee, I've been in touch with survivors who in the meantime have passed away. Yes, and uh, in my guided tours at times I talk about that time witness of a time witness of having been a person um, who was a time witness. So I can tell people what someone said to me 20 years ago who was a witness of the time. And, well, I can tell you something from my experience. I think it was in 1994 when I was with a group of pupils school kids who were on a guided tour with me and I wanted to send them upstairs. And I think they were from Hamburg. So I told them that in December 1941, the people deported from Hamburg uh, came to a camp near Riga. There wasn't even a fence around the camp. It was all improvisation. And there were some some Latvian collaborators who were helping secure uh, this big camp, which was a former farm building. And one of the Hamburg boys said, well, uh, it's clear you'll leave that camp, you get away. And then there was an elderly lady standing next to them. And she said to him, no, you can't escape. I was there. And you won't leave the place because you will be leaving your parents and and um, your grandparents behind. And so these these young people stood there, shell shocked, and they started talking to the lady. And it was a great conversation that went on for forty five minutes. So these were sort of flashlights that lasted for some time. Of course, I uh, I spoke to the lady because the Jungfernhof camp was what I was interested in. And yes, we stayed in touch, but of course, uh, with the passing of the time and the passing away of the time witnesses, this first-hand information 
supply comes to a natural end. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I think we could go on for a long time now. This was great. We will take a 15 minute break now. I wanted to add that there aren't many survivors left, but their children also come to the library. And it's always in the most important encounters for myself and for my colleagues. And after the pandemic ends, I hope we will be in touch again, in direct touch again with um, people from Israel and from the US. So this is my last comment. We will take a 15 minute break now, after which we will introduce our digital projects mentioned before. Thank you.